G'day, I'm Brett. I'm at MR Automotive in Redcliffe, Queensland, home of Maxi Drive products. I'm here to have my front axle completely rebuilt to improve strength, reliability, and off-road traction performance. So let's take a look now at some of the upgrades I'll be doing on the front axle. It will include a conversion of the axles from 10 spline to 24 spline Maxi Drive units, installation of a Detroit True Track limited slip diff, changing from the later CVs to earlier one ton Land Rover AEU 2522s, which are the strongest Land Rover ever produced, and also changing the drive flanges to Maxi Drive drive flanges, which are made from better quality materials. So let's go through now each of these components. Now I'm upgrading from the 1032 spine, which I have originally in the Land Rover front axle, which is one of the worst combinations produced by Land Rover. And I'm changing to a 2423 spline maxi drive unit. Now these are manufactured from aircraft material known as high tough nickel chrome molly steel and heat treated to 1550 MPA. So they work out about 50% stronger than the original Land Rover axles. So let's take a quick look at the before and after to show you the differences between 10 spline and 24 spline half shafts. So this is the original 10 spline unit and this is the upgraded 24 spline. So not only is the actual shaft diameter bigger on the 24 spline, but there's more surface area around the spine region. So we take the measurements. It works out at 28.23 mil for 10 spline and 31.6 for a 24 spline. So it's significantly bigger as well as the stronger material. 10 splines have a history of the splines twisting or the ends shearing off in the diff. Due to the depth of the 10 splines, it significantly reduces the minor diameter or the core diameter of the shaft, which is where the weakness is introduced. The 32 spline CV end has the smallest diameter of all the shafts and is typically prone to the splines shearing off due to their fineness or the end snaps off in the CV. This is a table of the half shaft and CV combinations that were produced so you can get an idea as to what combination you are running in your vehicle. The counties up to mid 20L axle code had 1023. My late 200 TDI had 1032, the weakest spline combination produced. From around 300 TDI onwards, it changed to 2432. But if you want the absolute strongest shaft, you have to go aftermarket to Maxi Drive, Ashcroft, Cam, and among a few others, to a 24 diff end, 23 CV end. Most 200 TDIs should be able to convert to the earlier County or Ashcroft CVs easily, but for 300 TDIs onwards, it's best to use an aftermarket CV from Ashcroft or similar, which have a later style CV built from stronger materials but with a 23 spline input for the aftermarket shaft. Now the difference in the material strength between standard 10 and 24 spline half shafts is actually pretty minimal. It was the design of the spline area, which is typically where the failures occur. You can find a graph on Ashcroft Transmission's website showing braking tests they did with the short 10 and 24 spline half shafts showing that they both break around the same amount of force applied, although the amount of twist each can handle before failure is quite different. But by converting to aftermarket half shafts, you're getting far superior material strength and the stronger 24-23 spine combination. This table I made shows the measurements of the shaft diameters. You can see the 32 CV end minor diameter is only 24.9 millimeters which is the smallest diameter of all the shafts. Compare that to the Maxi Drive 23 CV end shaft, minor diameter of 28.5 millimeters, which is still larger than all of the measurements of the original 10 spline shaft. The CVs are being changed from the later RTC 6862s to the earlier County one ton army style 
AEU 2522s, which are the strongest Land Rover ever produced. You can see clearly here the difference in the shaft diameter inputs, the 32 spline and the 23 spline. I'm also upgrading the drive flanges to maxi drive drive flanges, which have a bit more spline area and are made from stronger materials and can be used for oil lubricated systems with a better sealing design with a steel cap. Now I'm replacing the Land Rover two pin diff as it's the pin, which is a two pin diff, only has a single pin, it's prone to cracking or snapping and the spider gears can also crush and, and break off. The housing can also wear out and where the pin fits in, it can overlate and the pin can flog around inside. So this is being replaced with a Detroit True Track limited slip diff. The Eaton Detroit True Track is an automatic torque biasing limited slip differential. I chose this unit as it is a simple design using gears, not clutch packs. It has no electronics or airlines and doesn't need special diff oils. The unit requires no maintenance. It will transfer up to 3.5 times more torque to the wheel with greater traction when the opposite wheel is spinning, thus helping to drive the vehicle forward. The downside of the design is if one wheel lifts completely off the ground and has no resistance, it acts like an open diff. But the unit can be tricked with some left foot braking to provide resistance, which will then help the wheel with traction continue to move forward. The differential is made with three helical worm gears and a side gear on each side. When traction is lost, the helical worm gears are forced outwards into the carrier, producing friction. It's this friction which reduces the spinning of the spinning wheel and helps divert more torque to the wheel which still has traction. I chose this over a full locking differential as it's used 100% of the time to provide greater traction compared to the 2% of times I may actually need a full locking differential. I've had a Detroit True Track installed in the rear axle for the last three years and it has performed flawlessly. I'm quite certain it has helped me not get bogged on a few occasions. So the downside of this upgrade is I have strengthened the rest of the drive line so it will send strain to the weakest link which would now be either the ring and pinion or the gearbox and transfer case which are more expensive to fix obviously. But I think this is unlikely as I am running standard tyres in my style of driving is typically touring outback areas, I'm not doing rock crawling, I'm not typically going any really challenging tracks, I'm just exploring. So this should give me plenty of reliability and I doubt there'll be any issues with failing components as I have already rebuilt the gearbox transfer case and all the rear axle has already been upgraded to maxi drive units. So I think this is a rock solid upgrade. Okay, my initial impressions just after the drive home. The steering is a lot more firmer in the return to center. As I come out of a corner, I can feel the wheel wanting to come back a lot more strongly than what it previously did, but that seems to be fairly acceptable. And also, before I got the conversion done, I jacked up my front wheel. I grabbed on the wheel and I turned it and watched the prop shaft and I could move it from about 12 o'clock to around one o'clock position. So there's a fair bit of slop play before the prop shaft would begin to move. I've just done the same thing and I can literally move it about one centimeter and the prop shaft moves. So a lot of driveline slop has been taken out, which should be a really good thing. The price. It came in to around 4,000 Australian dollars for the complete upgrade, which included the diff, the axles, drive flanges, CVs, and all the labor and other parts, the bearings, sealing kits, oil. I feel that's a fairly reasonable price because I'm thinking about reliability in remote areas. So I can't afford to break down in the middle of Australia, particularly when I'm out exploring Western Australia, which is what I hope to intend to do fairly soon. The distances are too vast and the cost of recovery to get someone out all the way to collect my car and get me back to safety is just way too much. For, for instance, if you break down in the middle of the Simpson Desert, you can expect to pay 
a starting recovery cost of 10,000 Australian dollars. And that's just the starting cost. You have to have that money available before they'll even turn on the engine of the recovery truck to come out and get you. So I think 4,000 now is much more better than spending $10,000 later plus the, re the cost of repairs to the car and plus the danger to my life and those who come out to rescue me which could be you know three, four, five days drive to get to where I am depending on where I'm exploring at the time. So that's for reliability and safety, I'm happy to spend that money now. Now please remember that I am a Land Rover enthusiast, not a Land Rover expert. So the information I've presented in this video, although I've tried to research it the best I can and present it as far as I know as accurately as I can, there could always be some incorrect information. So do your own research and check all your own part numbers, chassis numbers against the specifications for different parts. So a special thanks to Blake and the team at MR Automotive for completing the conversion and for allowing me access into their workshop to do some filming. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe if you enjoyed this video. Visit my website roamingtheoutback.com for Australian travel destinations, vehicle preparation ideas and gear reviews. If you'd like to help support the creation of new videos, please consider becoming a Patreon. Click on the Patreon button on the screen now. Thanks.